This video is sponsored by BetterHelp. Twenty Twenty One Spiral is the only Saw film in this near two decade old franchise I've actually seen in cinemas, and hearing that iconic bone chilling final score blasting through the big screen was a horror nerd moment I've always wanted to experience. For me personally, the Saw movies are very hit and miss in terms of their trashy gratuity, and as one of the ultimate guilty pleasures, there's this twisted charm to its contrived and preposterous plot structure that this distinguishes it from all the other torture porn flicks that the sequels help popularize. However, as I've said before, creators James Wan and Lee Winnell only ever viewed Saw as their version of David Fincher and Andrew Kevin Walker's Seven, in which the traps were only a brief, if significant, feature to what was more of a convoluted escape room mystery thriller about morality and a macabre philosophy that makes uh, just as much sense as my accent. The 2004 original really stands apart from the sequels as the focus was predominantly on character and putting us in this hazy, nasty, borderline dystopian world that felt increasingly disconnected from reality. It forced you into the harrowing shoes of its victims and created a nightmare so sickening and diabolical that I genuinely rate it as one of the most disturbing American films of the 21st century, at least conceptually speaking that is. Although, after six sequels, two video games, and a forgotten reboot, of all the people in the world to take another stab at a reboot in this era of requelitis, we turn to Chris fucking Rock. So, here's the thing, like everyone, I was left so baffled when it was announced Chris Rock was developing a new entry designed to reinvigorate the franchise, that it honestly came as no surprise when it was also announced that Samuel L. Jackson would appear in the film. As such, it became my civic duty to see what this would become, and after seeing that eerie, ominous poster, I felt cautiously optimistic, and I gotta be honest, it actually became probably Probably one of my favourite entries into the franchise, but that's not exactly a tall order when you consider what came before it. Now, for the record, I'm not saying Spiral is underrated or anything, I think its mixed reception rates it appropriately because yes, it is more of the same, but I respect its efforts to try and tweak the formula somewhat slightly, even if it never reaches the potential of its topical setup. As always, as we go along, please make sure to leave your thoughts on Spiral and the Saw franchise in the comments below, and maybe leave a cheeky wee like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And lastly, here are a few words from this video sponsor, BetterHelp. If you've been following me for a while, you'll know I'm pretty open about my mental health because having lived a large part of my life with depression and anxiety, the best way I learned to cope with it is by simply talking about it. In fact, it's only in the last two years have I proactively bettered myself through private therapy. However, I understand many do not have the luxury of travel, finance, or therapy options in their area. But if you're feeling depressed, anxious, stressed, or overwhelmed, then this video sponsors sponsor BetterHelp is a wonderful solution to gaining access to a compassionate guiding therapist. BetterHelp offers an online network of over 20,000 licensed therapists trained to listen and help you in a way that's convenient and catered to your specific needs. You simply fill out a questionnaire to assess your circumstances and BetterHelp matches you with a therapist within 48 hours. From there, you can schedule phone calls and video calls from the comfort of your home and even exchange unlimited messages, all of which are completely confidential. There are two features to BetterHelp that specifically stand out to me. For one, you can keep an online journal to record your thoughts and discoveries as you progress on your journey. And secondly, at any time, you can request a new therapist at no additional charge so you can match with the help that is right for you. You can get 10% off your first month by going to betterhelp.com slash Ryan Hollinger or by clicking the link in the description box below. Join the 2 million plus people who have taken charge of their mental health with an experienced BetterHelp therapist, and I wish you the very best on your journey. 
Spiral from The Book of Saw tells the story of Detective Zeke Banks, an angry, disillusioned cop left alienated by his precinct after exposing internal police corruption, who begins investigating a series of murders that mirror the notorious Jigsaw slayings, in which victims must mutilate themselves to survive elaborate traps. The main distinction with Spiral is that the series' iconic villain John Kramer is completely out of the picture, with the focus shifting to an isolated copycat killer who exclusively targets crooked cops in Zeke's own precinct for reasons I'll explain later. It doesn't require you to have seen the original series, but it certainly doesn't hurt to get an understanding of Kramer's deeply problematic philosophy as it does play a role in the outcome. Yet, as I said, I'll come back to that later because Emblem of the series as a whole, it has a very contradicting and conflicting message. In fact, of all the films out there, I'm going to use The Batman to explain just how significant of a missed opportunity Spiral had to make a genuinely meaningful point about Kramer's philosophy and copycat killers, so look forward to that odd yet fitting comparison. Anyway, from an atmospheric and stylistic standpoint, Spiral is actually remarkably faithful to Juan and Winnell's original film than any of the sequels. I mean, there's no getting past it's a carbon copy of Seven, but without the careful nuance, but the cinematography wonderfully conveys the intensity, sharpness, and overwhelmed disposition of the characters and their surroundings, with the presentation of the copycat having a rougher, low-key edge to it to distinguish it from Kramer's legacy. There's a much-needed simplicity that helps grind the film closer to the original. Instead of the increasingly carnivalesque funhouse, there's a greater attention placed on intimacy. Correct me if I'm wrong, but other than Jigsaw, I think Spiral is the only other Saw movie to actually take place in daylight without compromising its sense of oppression. There's still a brooding sense of suffocating claustrophobia, with the characters retaining a constant emotional boiling point for the entire runtime that's further heightened by a heatwave serving as a motif for the angst and frustration every character is experiencing. It's too fucking hot here for me to listen to this bullshit. I got a heat wave going on. We got rolling blackouts. The city is nuts. Stop! Visually, it feels dizzying, restless, icky, and downright nauseating with the choice of hotter colors and lighting. It elicits a humidity and stuffiness as opposed to simply using cold blues and greens. As such, there's a more organic energy to its presentation that doesn't depend on the overly stylized tone of the original series. However, with all those compelling atmospheric considerations put to the side, the thing that really enamored me about the film was just how pulpy the characters and performances were. Like how the original felt like this eccentric take on neo-noir, Spiral has this slightly exploitation, hard-boiled 70s detective vibe that continues to tap into the series' campy melodrama. You wanna play games, motherfucker? Chris Rock's delivery comes across as both scene-chewing and try-hard, and I genuinely cannot tell if it's intentional. I'm aware he did script doctor the film to add touches of humour to it, but I find it much funnier when all the bad jokes and ball-busting attitudes fell completely flat on their face. Me no one, no partner! It reminded me of something like Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, where the B-movie level crassness clashes hard with the self-seriousness to create something cringeworthy, yet strangely endearing. Boz was my friend! Fuck me? No! Fuck you! It certainly helps that both Rock and Jackson have natural charisma, but I question how much of it is truly self-aware and simply just a legitimate effort to be taken seriously, considering Rock opens up about wanting to try more dramatic roles like he did in Fargo. As a result, there's this uncanny, timeless quality to its style that's molded around Rock's vanity, and it works in its favour because it makes the journey all the more fun. Prepare to be underwhelmed. Kinda like Wan's choice to make the original Saw feel like this unending nightmare, there's something unreal yet palpable about Rock's version of the Saw world that feels personal and subjective, and it comes across immensely in how it delivers its literal and just as figurative violence. 
In my view, Zeke Banks is a cross between Eric Matthews and Daniel Rigg from the original series. He has Rigg's impatience, defiance and insubordination to get the job done, as well as Matthews' hot-headedness and impulsive bursts of aggression, all of which are traits that became the downfall of those characters. The main conflict around Zeke is that he's left unjustly ostracised by his precinct for ratting out his partner Pete for killing a witness who was meant to testify against police corruption causing him to, understandably, distrust and bark at those around him as he suffers significant stress, isolation and betrayal for what life has thrown at him. Counseling? Hey, that's nice. Yeah, my wife fucked a counselor. He's an interesting character that also fuses together the nihilism and apathy of Detective Somerset and unhealthy rage and cynicism of Detective Mills from Seven. Like other characters in the series, you're just waiting for him to break his moral compass. Yet the film never truly indulges on his behaviour despite evidently slipping in and out of ethical procedures to solve the case. He's established to be a clean cop, somewhat acting as a potential mentor for his new partner William, who appears to be the only character with a warm and hopeful demeanour, only to be bitterly rebuked by Zeke that his happy life will one day crash and burn like his did. When you decide to become a cop, you pretty much assured yourself you were gonna die alone. It's a shame, however, that Zeke and William do not get the same relationship development as Somerset and Mills in Seven, because William is presented as having a similar idealism that Zeke once had in his younger years before witnessing his partner's corruption, and so seeing how their worldviews clash could have made for some thoughtful character moments. Zeke even tells William he's basically a cautionary tale for what having hope and aspiration can bring, playing into life's cruel sense of injustice this, where doing the right thing can sometimes just lead to personal trauma and suffering. It effectively gets across that ugly, horrible feeling that injustice brings. In fact, the atmosphere works because it made me feel the same sense of anger Zeke constantly exhibits. He might be jaded by his experiences, but Zeke is a good guy, his heart is in the right place, and he simply wants to bring peace and justice. But it's only ever inflicted pain onto him more so than than any trap possibly could. The film's real torture comes from how Zeke's noble moral actions simply were not worth the toll it's taken on his life. Especially when crooked cops continue to be shot out by the system with a slap on the wrists anyway, such is the case with his murderous former partner Pete. Now, from this point on, I'm going to go into ending spoilers because the way it handles its traps in connection to its closing revelations does bring the whole story full circle, so to speak. But, of course, not without its trademark messiness. So, as expected, each trap is explicitly related to the corruption of each victim, who are also associated to Zeke. The first victim, Marv, is said to be the only cop to have stood by Zeke and was in fact his best friend, but was corrupt in his own way by falsely testifying under oath, leading to wrongful convictions, thus his trap involved tearing out his tongue. The second cop, Fitch, is told to remove his fingers for pulling the trigger on an innocent man, but this is when people start to suspect Zeke was in on the trap, as Fitch clearly resented him for ratting on Pete and ignored Zeke's calls for backup during a case that nearly got him killed. Apparently this guy had his trap cut from the film due to censorship, so assuming he did die in the story because he just sort of disappears at one point, he was complicit in Fitch's corruption. We then have Pete, who, as I said, killed a testifying witness in cold blood, but his trap is technically a test for Zeke to see if he will let Pete live or die for his corruption. However, probably the most interesting and closely fleshed out aspect of the precinct's dirty history is really Related to its two leaders, Angie and Marcus, the latter being Zeke's own father. Despite being a friend of Zeke's, Angie's punishment is revealed to be the result of her efforts to cover up internal corruption along with Marcus, which I took as a little unfair given she wasn't in a comfortable position of power to oppose Marcus, so while complicit and unwilling to take responsibility for the damages, in her own way, she's kind of a victim caught in the crossfire of all this. Although she is currently the leader of the precinct, so it is on her to do her duty and take responsibility for everything that's going on within it. 
So, throughout the story, there is mention of a policy called Article 8, which was introduced by Marcus as a way to basically justify police brutality and corruption in the name of stopping crimes and deterring future ones. So, essentially giving each cop license to go outside the law to, uh, enforce the law. Which, as you'd expect, isn't exactly a power you want protective authorities to wield discriminately. I think revealing Marcus to be the big bad of the precinct, whose violent influence for protecting its reputation as a political move, rather than taking culpability for the actions of himself and his officers, is a deeply distressing message. But I don't think its delivery entirely sticks the landing. Zeke is meant to be shown to have escaped the shadow of his domineering father, but they barely have any scenes together to truly establish the strain between them. All this information is presented in such a fragmented way that, with enough polish, it could have had a hell of a stronger impact, especially when taking Marcus's horrific death into account, where, like a puppet on strings, a SWAT team are baited into executing him as he's suspended in a way that makes him look like an active shooter, which which is literally a scene taken straight out of Fargo. In short, for the typical fashion of this series, it takes an unnecessarily convoluted route to demonstrating the systematic nature of corruption and the hypocritical sense of loyalty all the characters have. I think the argument could be made that the story simply has too much to cover in such a short amount of time, thus diluting the urgency of a very real issue. Anyway, this brings us on to the copycat killer, who is far too easy to work out, especially after a certain character death that happens over an hour into the film. So yeah, of course it was fucking William. You don't hire Max Minghella and give him nothing to do. He's so evidently out of place compared to the other cops in the precinct, and not only is his death by flailing committed entirely off screen, it's not even a fucking trap. It's presented as just a straight up murder with zero connection to police corruption. Honestly, given how late into the film this supposed death occurs, it would have been more of a misdirection to keep him alive, kind of like how Amanda is in the trap in Saw 2. It's revealed his motivation is to strike fear into the system to encourage police reform after his father was murdered by Pete for being the very man who was meant to testify against police corruption. As such, he wishes for Zeke to become his partner and snuff out other crooked cops, seeing as Zeke is supposedly the only truly good cop left in town, despite William having witnessed Zeke break police protocol to assault and question a drug dealer earlier in the story. It seemed to me that the entire investigation should have been more of a test to see what Zeke's morality was truly like, given he's on the brink of emotional collapse at the beginning of the story. None of the motive makes any sense when you read into it, and as a result it suffers from the exact same problematic philosophy of John Kramer, which I would argue should have been more of the point. In its context, William is basically a vigilante taking his methods to such an extreme, from the Book of Saw as it were. He's ultimately a depraved, vengeful psychopath who thinks his actions are justified in order to set an example for the greater good, which is exactly what Article 8 was designed to be. The movie then ends abruptly before you have any real time to digest what he actually tells Zeke, who naturally opposes everything he says. However, the crazy thing is, the Batman, which itself was moulded from Seven, legitimately tackled this whole issue with the logic and intelligence Spiral is missing. Okay, so bear with me here because this is naturally going to sound ridiculous. To put it into perspective, William sees himself as a hero who must use fear to create change, which itself partially derives from Kramer's philosophy that we all deserve to suffer and face punishment for our unjust misdemeanors deeds. Kramer's legacy and martyrdom, which kept the sequels alive via protégés who themselves were tested for their worthiness, is the type of philosophy that attracts the wrong kind of people. 
To put it simply, martyrdom can give validity to bad forms of faith, and this is exactly what Kramer's philosophy became, despite the fact the films never actually addressed it. He created a murder cult where its already terrible message got lost to even worse people who took up the reign. In the Batman spoilers, by the way, the Riddler is revealed to be nothing more than an angsty, attention-seeking insult who interprets Batman's self-described symbol of fear as a positive contribution to Gotham. Thus, the Riddler believes that it justifies his terrorism as comparable to that of Batman's vigilantism, since he's also fighting the city's corruption. In other words, this young, inexperienced Batman who's motivated by anger and vengeance for what Gotham has done to him, comes to the harrowing realisation that framing himself as a symbol of fear to create change means that, while he might deter street-level crime, he's practically inspiring even worse people to take advantage of that message, a message he ultimately can't control once it's out there. As such, in the conclusion, having learned from his experiences, Batman attempts to reposition himself as the beacon of light and hope that Gotham needs, bluntly symbolised by him guiding the people out of the drowning building following a terrorist attack that he indirectly helped inspire. There's a prevailing theme of taking accountability for your image and setting an example. It's not simply for the wicked and corrupt, but also for those who forget or overlook how much influence and power they ultimately have, regardless of how they choose to wield it. It literally tackles Spiral's same issue of systematic poisoning and the uncontrollable domino effect it has on everything around it, but actually uses its two and a half hour runtime to really delve into its complexities because it's an issue that cannot easily be addressed in a 90 minute splatter flick. That critical acknowledgement of legacy and vigilante behaviour is exactly what I feel Spiral needed. It ends prematurely without ever challenging the core problem with the Book of Saw. It glorifies Kramer as a martyr who supposedly had a point instead of showing William to be just as violent, corrupt and hypocritical as the very people he killed. Spiral's focus on police corruption was a perfect opportunity to deconstruct Saw's entire concept, and make an actual point out of the pointlessness of its traps. I will always enjoy the Saw movies as mindless slasher flicks, while still commending the first few films for setting up a fun puzzle of interconnected plotlines, but with that said, it's a shame that in the one entry to focus on a true harrowing subject matter, it's still no deeper than the pools of blood this series ultimately prefers to relish in. If you've once again made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Please leave your thoughts on Spiral and the other Saw movies in the comments below, and until next time, stay safe, stay away from corruption, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye!